This video forms part of a series of three videos explaining activity-based costing. In this video, we take a look at why we use ABC and some of the benefits and drawbacks associated with it. In the second video, we will continue with the explanation by taking you through an example using more than one product. And in the third video, we take a brief look at what we call time-driven activity-based costing. To appreciate why ABC can be beneficial, it is useful to look at an example of using what we would call a traditional method of overhead absorption. The problem we are faced with in costing products is how to allocate the overheads or fixed costs to products when using a full product cost approach. Traditionally, we would use a single overhead absorption rate, but as we will see later, this can distort product costs and even result in poor decisions about products. Typically, the single rate will be based on a single activity such as labour hours, which will give us a dollar rate per hour, or machine hours, giving us a dollar rate per machine hour, or sometimes a seemingly arbitrary basis such as material used, which will give us a dollar rate per kilogram used. This video is structured in two parts. In the first part, we'll look at an example of costing products using a single overhead absorption rate. And in part two, we look at the concept of ABC and give an illustration of how it's used based on a single product. If you're familiar with using a single overhead absorption rate, then I'd suggest you fast forward until you find the slide that's headed the concept of ABC. Let's use a very simple example by taking an overhead absorption rate of a dollar per kilogram of material used. And then we'll work it again using an absorption rate of a dollar rate per labour hour. And then we can compare the two in terms of the resultant costs and profits. Let's take some basic data for three products. We have product A, B and C. Each has the same selling price of $20. We're given the materials for each product, so one kilogram to produce product A, two kilograms for B and three for C, and we're also given the price per kilogram. We're told labor hours are three hours, two hours, and one hours for A to C respectively, and told that it's $5 per labor hour. We're also given the volumes produced for each product. Further, we're told that the fixed costs are $12,000. Now, first of all, let's look at using an overhead absorption rate using the materials for each product. In order to do this, we need to calculate the total material used. So for product A, if it takes one kilogram to produce one product, to produce a thousand, it takes us a thousand kilograms. And the same process for products B and C, which gives us a total of 6,000 kilograms. What we can now do is to use our $12,000 for the fixed overheads, divide that by the 6,000 kilograms of material used, and that will give us a rate of $2 per kilogram. So what we've calculated is what we call an overhead absorption rate. Let's calculate the product costs and then the profit based on using materials as our overhead allocation method. As a starting point, let's put in our selling price of $20 for each product. Next, we can put in the materials. So looking at the bottom of the slide, if you remember for product A, we were using one kilogram of material and that would cost us $2. So materials for A is $2, and using the same process for B and C, we can arrive at $4 for B and $6 worth of materials to produce product C. We can do the same for labor. So for product A, using three hours, costing us $5 per hour is $15, and the same process for B and C. If we then take our selling price, deduct the materials and the labor costs, we arrive at the contribution for each product towards the fixed costs. 
Now we can allocate our fixed costs. And remember we're using materials as the basis for doing this. So for product A, we'll be using one kilogram of material. And on our previous calculation of the overhead absorption rate, we arrived at a kilogram rate of $2. Therefore, for product A, we can allocate fixed costs of one kilogram worth of material multiplied by our two dollars for fixed costs absorption. And similarly for product B, it was going to take us two kilograms to produce product B, and at two dollars for the fixed overhead absorption rate, we can calculate four dollars of fixed costs for product B, and the same process for product C. Having allocated our fixed costs, we can now deduct those from the contribution and arrive at a profit for each product. If we then take our volumes and multiply that by the profit per product, we can arrive at a total profit of $6,000. Let's now quickly take you through the process again, but this time using labour hours as our basis for allocating the overheads. In order to do this, we need to calculate the total number of labour hours used. So on the same basis as we did with the materials, we simply multiply the labour hours for each product by the volumes of the products produced. And this gives us a total of 6,000 hours. In the same way we did with the materials, we can take our fixed cost of $12,000, but this time divide it by the 6,000 hours and that gives us a $2 per labour hour overhead absorption rate. Let's now calculate our profit per product. The contribution will be exactly the same as it was when we used the materials as the basis. So again, taking our selling price, less materials, less labour, gives us our contribution. Let's now allocate our fixed costs, but this time using labour hours. So for product A, we'll be using three hours. If we multiply that by our $2 per labour hour overhead absorption rate, we're going to allocate $6 of fixed costs to product A. And using the same basis for products B and C, we can arrive at our profit and loss for each product by deducting the fixed cost allocation from the contribution. In the same way as we did before, if we multiply our product profit by the volumes produced, we can arrive at the total profit. And again, because nothing's actually changed except the way we've allocated the overheads, we still make a total profit of $6,000. So let's just double check that. Here you can see at the bottom of the screen our allocations when we were using the materials as our basis. Now we still make $6,000 whichever basis we use because nothing's changed except the basis that we've used. So we need to be very careful when making decisions because if we use labour hours, what happens is that it tends to load costs to those products that are labour intensive. In this instance, you can see that product A has attracted more overhead costs simply because it uses more labour and it's also forced a loss for product A, where when we were using materials as the basis, product A actually made a profit, albeit the smallest of the three products. But when we use materials as the basis, what we'll see is that product C now has more overheads allocated to it, simply because it used more material. So we need to be very careful when we're allocating overheads on a single overhead absorption rate. We can change the profit or loss for each product simply by using a different method. And this is where activity-based costing helps us allocate on a much fairer basis. Let's now turn our attention to looking at the concept of activity-based costing. Advocates of activity-based costing suggest that organisations consist of a series of interrelated activities. That's these activities, such as materials handling, or the number of orders raised, that creates the cost. Now, products and services then make demands on the activities, causing the costs to rise. And there's a linkage 
between the demands placed on the activity, i.e. the number of orders raised to create that product, or the number of materials handling or the number of machine setups. And this creates a relationship between the activity and the cost. And ABC seeks to establish this relationship so that products and services are costed on what we might describe as a more appropriate basis. In the activity-based costing process, we're taking our total overheads and breaking it down into different elements. So in stage one, we're looking at the costs of the activities, such as materials handling, procurement and setup. We can then look at using the most appropriate basis for allocating those costs to the products. So for example, procurement might be a cost per order, or the setup would most logically be the cost per setup. One important point to note is that when we've been talking about fixed overhead costs, we're referring to costs that can be meaningfully allocated to products or services. We also refer to these as indirect product costs, and sometimes they're referred to as production overheads. We can look at ABC as a series of steps. So in our first step, we're identifying the activities that generate indirect product costs. Activities such as materials handling or machine setups. We can then estimate the cost of these activities. So for example, we might have, let's say, 10 people working in a central purchasing department. So we can take their salaries and associated costs, building costs, etc., if appropriate, and we can arrive at the cost of the central purchasing activity. What we then need to do is select a cost driver, and in our central purchasing example, this might be the number of purchase orders raised. We can then estimate the cost driver usage for all of the products produced by the company. In this instance, how many purchase orders are they likely to raise during the next year? We can then calculate our cost driver application rate. So in other words, we can arrive at a cost per purchase order. And we can then trace these activities to each product. Let's take a simple example. And we're just going to use one product here, although the company will produce a range of products. But eventually we'll isolate product A. So we've got product A. Now it has an annual production of 40,000 units. The direct materials per unit are $5, and the direct labour per unit is 10 minutes. We're also told direct labour are paid $12 per hour, and we're told that the manufacturing overheads equal $295,000. One of the first things we need to do with activity-based costing is to break our overheads down into what we call cost pools. And these are the activities that we can meaningfully allocate costs to. So for example, materials ordering, let's imagine we have a central purchasing department and there are five members of staff in there and they're based in an office. So we can meaningfully allocate the costs to that cost pool. And of course, if we're raising orders associated with particular products, then we could use the number of orders raised on each product as a means of allocating the costs to the products. The same with materials inspection. We could isolate the costs associated with goods inwards, inspecting materials as they're received, and writing up the report and making sure that everything's okay. The cost of actually setting up the machines to produce product A or product B. We can isolate those costs separately. Now there's usually, in reality, a small element of cost, in this instance we've just called it other costs, that we can't meaningfully allocate on any specific basis. So we'll return to this point shortly. The next step is to ascertain our cost drivers. Now they're called cost drivers because it's the thing that drives the cost that we're looking at. So for materials ordering, if we suddenly had to raise twice the number of orders in the year, we would need more members of staff. And therefore you could argue that the most appropriate thing that drives the cost of materials ordering is the number of orders that we need to raise. And similarly, you could argue with the equipment setups, the more times we need to set up machines to produce products, 
the bigger the cost will be. So we use what we call a cost driver as the most appropriate basis on which to allocate that particular cost pool to products. Then we come to our other costs. We usually find that there's no specific basis that we can allocate these on, so we do have to use some sort of arbitrary basis, which in real life is typically the direct labour hours associated with each product. If it's more appropriate, we might use the machine hours where products are produced via machines rather than with a lot of labour input. Having decided the basis on which we're going to allocate costs, we then need to ascertain the number of orders that we'll raise in the year, the number of inspection reports, the number of equipment setups, quality control inspections and direct labour hours. So we have to collect this data and very often it's how many orders do you think you're going to raise in the year, i.e. we would use an estimate, a point we'll come back to later. Now notice this is for all products. The next step is to calculate the cost application rates. And what we need to do is to take our total costs and divide it by the total quantity. If we take materials ordering as an example, we have $60,000 of cost and an anticipated 7,500 orders to be raised. So dividing one by the other, we arrive at a cost per order of $8. And in effect, what this means is that every time we raise an order related to a particular product, it's going to cost us $8. Now we can do this for materials inspection, equipment setups, quality control, and the other costs. And what you can see here is that we have arrived at a cost per order, a cost per report, cost per setup, a cost per inspection, and a cost per direct labor hour. So this gives us the ability to allocate overhead costs to each product based on the activities that they incur. Another important point while we're on this slide is that it highlights expensive activities and therefore management might be interested to know that it costs $100 per report. And therefore, is there a better way of doing that? Can it be made more efficient? So an advantage of activity-based costing is that it raises management's awareness of the cost of carrying out these particular activities. Now what we need to do is to allocate these to product A. And this is where we need the number of orders, the number of inspections, etc. that relate just to product A. So an important point to note is that we calculate the rates using the total volumes for all products. And then in costing product A, we can simply isolate the volumes and activities that relate to product A. What we can then do is to use our rates and the volumes associated with product A to allocate the overheads that will be attributable to producing product A. And on this slide you can see that we've taken a materials ordering of 2,000 orders related to product A, multiplied it by our $8 per order to arrive at a cost of $16,000 associated with product A only. And we've done this for each particular cost classification. We've arrived at a total of $29,200 of overheads allocated to product A. If we then take our $29,200 of overhead and divide that by the 40,000 units produced of product A, we can arrive at an overhead rate per product of $0.73 or 73 cents. If we then add to that the materials and the labour costs, we can calculate the total product cost. So the materials, labour, add on our overheads, we arrive at a total cost of $7.73. What we've done by using activity-based costing is adopted a more sophisticated method of allocating the production overheads to products and this creates a fairer allocation of cost for us. So instead of taking our total overheads and using a single rate, 
we've broken it down into more appropriate cost pools and then used significantly the most appropriate basis for allocating that classification of cost to the products, such as number of materials ordered, number of inspections, etc. And this process gives us a much fairer allocation of costs and helps us with the pricing decisions much more effectively. Returning briefly to our slide showing the steps in the process, we used the word estimate when we were looking at costs of activities and the cost driver usage. So we're looking to forecast the costs of the next year and the amount of volume that we'll use for each activity. We use the forecast as next year might not be the same as last year, but we can however use the historical figures on which to base the estimates. It's always useful to check using the actual figures if the time and resources allow, and of course our estimates would get better over time. Let's now turn quickly to the benefits and the drawbacks. The benefits of using activity-based costing are said to be that it gives us a more appropriate method of costing of the products and services. It allows for the better and more comprehensive understanding of overheads and what causes them to occur. It also makes costly and potentially non-value adding activities more visible. So this allows managers to focus on those areas to reduce or eliminate them. And it supports other management techniques such as continuous improvement, scorecards and performance management and allocating costs to serve in customer profitability analysis or CPA as it's sometimes known. So what this would do is give us targets that we could use to try and improve or reduce the cost of certain activities. As with all techniques there are a few drawbacks. With ABC it can be difficult and time consuming to collect the data about the activities and cost drivers i.e. the non-financial data such as number of orders, number of setups. A lot of organisations today will use software that's capable of collecting that data on a regular basis. But if you haven't already collected it, you might have to set up a system in order to do so for the future. And therefore it can often be costly to implement, run and manage an ABC system. There might also be a training need or a training cost in that employees and managers will need to be trained in its use. And even with ABC, there's some overhead costs that are quite often difficult to assign to products and even customers. So we still have our little other costs element that we might be arbitrarily applying to products and customers. So why use ABC? Well, it could be beneficial where fixed costs are a high proportion of total costs. So service sector organisations that have potentially just people costs and establishment costs it gives them a much better way of allocating costs to products and services. It enables management to understand their business, which should, hopefully, lead to better decisions and planning. It improves management's focus on the firm's critical success factors and enhances its competitive advantage, i.e. those activities that are critical to the success of the organisation. It also helps you decide what activities to undertake and how much do they actually cost? How well are they performed? Do they add value to the customer? So looking at a business in terms of its activities, it gives you a means of assessing their effectiveness in providing good customer service. It also, as we've mentioned before, can be used in conjunction with benchmarking and can provide a comparison for outsourcing, i.e. it might be more efficient to get somebody else to perform that activity for you rather than you try and do it yourself. The other point to remember is that activities do not manage themselves. So using the information, managers need to take action. There are two other videos in this short series on activity-based costing, one which gives you an example using more than one product, and a second which looks at time-driven activity-based costing. There are also other videos and resources that can be found at the website www.managementaccountingandstrategy.com and the website promotes management accounting in support of strategy.